Um, so I thought about uh, when I negotiated with uh, with Michael about uh, what kind of talk to give in this uh, in this event. I thought uh, that anybody interested in uh, uh, communication and meaning uh, teams like in negotiations on should be informed about what is out there in terms of uh, available linguistic and knowledge resources. Uh, I've been working uh, with it, as Michael said, uh, in the past uh, seven eight years, and uh, when I when I mean. For linguistic resources, I mean any resource which deals with the language relations between words and providing some understanding of the meaning of those words in a, in a particular language like Italian, English, Chinese. Uh, in terms of knowledge resources, instead I mean uh, all those resources providing knowledge about the real world, which can be ontological in the sense that provides information about, I don't know, uh, dog is an animal or uh, ground knowledge, like uh, uh, Ischia is an island. So this kind of information is typically offered by, uh, uh, by some available uh, state-of-the-art resources, but there are, of course, pros and cons in each of them. So I'm going to give you uh, some initial motivation and use cases in which you could use uh, such resources. I will introduce them as, uh, as part of the solution to interoperability problems. And then I'll focus on, on some linguistic and knowledge resources in particular. And of course, given that I'm coming from Tarent, I'm biased, so I will provide also our point of view concerning, concerning this. And uh, most likely we will not have enough time, but in case uh, I can save a few minutes, I will also tell you about the kind of methodology that we are using in order to, to fill uh, resources with content. Uh, so let's start with motivation and use cases. So this is a, uh, a picture I always show uh, when I want to let people understand what interoperability is. So it's a comics that I found from the web, which shows a typical communication between me and my wife, and which typically my wife says, uh, can you take that T-shirt Maraschino there over there? And that I don't understand what she is speaking about. Just because we male are much simpler, we use a very simple vocabulary, and therefore, if she says, take that red t-shirt, okay, and I understand, and then I take that one. So that's to say that sometimes you have uh, two different parties, which can be two people or two software agents, having a totally different vocabulary. They mean different things with different terms, and they have to negotiate meaning. So they have to find a way to communicate. And here you see a kind of mapping between uh, the vocabulary used by the male and the vocabulary used by the female. So once you establish this mapping, then you are able to interoperate, which means basically the, the possibility to exchange effectively information between them. And um, so you, you see here a couple of definitions, but uh, I think now with this picture, the, more or less, the, 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 it's clear what I mean for that. And this is called uh, the semantic heterogeneity problem because typically uh, two different pieces of software use a different uh, way, uh, if, use different terms uh, for different things. What are the use cases in which uh, uh, linguistic resources would, uh, would help solving this problem? So one of them is semantic search. So for instance, you search on a, on a search engine for a certain word. If you only look for that word, maybe you find one result you are not even sure that the result is the one you want because you have to take into account that in languages there is, there is, uh, there is homonymy in meanings. So the same word can be used for, for, different, uh, for, for different meanings. But uh, if you have a, a linguistic resource which tells you what are the synonyms of a certain word, you can expand the query and provide, for instance, even this result because car is, is a synonym of automobile. And in order to uh, be able to uh, to, to, to issue this result, you have to have such a linguistic resource. Other clear example of this is natural language processing. So you have a piece of text in a certain language, and then you have to, to map it to definitions in a certain vocabulary. So you, you identify banks, and you understand that banks is not the institution, uh, but it's, uh, it's the river bank. And uh, you have the corresponding definition of river, and the Nile is actually an individual. And here you already see a difference between uh, terms denoting common nouns and terms denoting proper nouns. So uh, typically, 
what uh, uh, in linguistic resources you, you should find information about proper nouns, while common nouns denoting individuals is a typical content of a, of a knowledge resource. Another example that uh, Pavel showed you yesterday is semantic matching, so I'm not spending much time on it because you had uh, four hours of it yesterday. And uh, another one is data integration. So you have different data sets, each of them comes with, with its own schema, uh, with its own terms, and uh, typically what happens is that the person who injected the content in it understand what a certain st string stands for, but uh, as in the example of the colors, you never know what, what it actually means unless you make it explicit and you link it to a vocabulary, for instance. So if you, uh, data integration can be uh, approached by developing some pieces of software which uh, given some uh, uh, background knowledge, they are able to map to a unified schema or even uh, and, uh, with, with a common terminology. So what are the uh, solutions which are typically offered uh, to, to approach these problems? So uh, the problem is known as the semantic heterogeneity problem. The solutions uh, uh, are framed in terms of interoperability. interoperability. So, uh, early solutions are purely uh, technological in the sense that they rely on, uh, on some physical channels which put into communication different parties. You can think about uh, ODBC, for instance, in which you basically enforce that uh, the, 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 the parties that need to communicate uh, know exactly the language that they have to use in order to understand each other. So basically, they, they agree on a way by which uh, messages have to, be, uh, have to be exchanged. And this is also known as physical connectivity. So you physically connect uh, the two parties in order for them to exchange messages. A little bit weaker solution is syntactic connectivity. You can think about standards. So way by which you enforce the terminology, you know that a certain message has to be exchanged by using a precise, a precise term. And therefore, both agreed a priori about uh, the kind of messages that uh, they understand, that they have to be able to understand. Uh, in the semantic web, instead, the, com the typical solution which is employed is the one of uh, the semantic interoperability. That is, you define local dictionaries or ontologies which codify the meaning of the terms in the local, uh, in the local data sets, and then you map the local ontologies with uh, an upper level one, and uh, this will allow to, to map uh, each single term appearing here with, uh, uh, with, uh, with another term on the top. And in this way, applications running on top know about uh, the, the, the common ontology. And whenever they have to communicate uh, and, uh, and take data from the, the various data sets, they do some kind of transformation, uh, employing the terminology which has been mapped. Uh, there, are, there are typically three assumptions which are made uh, in this kind of solutions. You have to come up with a shared uh, vocabulary. Uh, you have to establish the mapping between the parties. And, and then uh, it's known, these mappings are known to be contextual. That is, uh, they don't have a, a universal validity, but uh, they are used exactly for this purpose. I think you all know about what an ontology is. For the, for the few of you that maybe don't, don't know it, it's something a beast like this, in which you have basically nodes which are interconnected with, uh, with relations. Uh, this is still an informal one in which you have, for instance, that mammals are animals and you have other kind of relations like, uh, I don't know, tigers eat, eat uh, chickens and, and, and you can think about arbitrary number of, uh, of relations within them. So I'm not going through the formalities of the definition, but as, uh, as Pavel also said yesterday, there are people like Gruninger who came with a classification of ontologies from the least formal to the most formal ones. So at one extreme, you, you only have a list of terms. You might have definitions of those uh, up to uh, very formal ontologies written in a web language like RDF or, or OWL. And um, depending on the purpose, so for instance, in library science, uh, there is a quite intensive usage of thesauri, which uh, basically only tells you that a certain class of, of documents is a subset 
of another class of documents. So in each single application, you have, uh, uh, you have differences in the format, the language used, the level of formality, and so on. Um, now I'm going to, to, uh, to, go in, uh, to go through some example of linguistic resources first and, uh, and uh, knowledge resources uh, uh, later on. So do you have questions so far in a way in which I close each module? And if you have questions, you have opportunity to ask them. No questions so far? Okay. So one of the most widespread uh, ones is WordNet. And basically it is a vocabulary of terms where terms are grouped into sets of synonyms called uh, synsets. Uh, so, for instance, here you have that stream and water course are, uh, are, are synonyms and there is a natural language definition for them. So, this kind of resources distinguish between different parts of speeches. So, you have uh, nouns, verbs, adjectives, um, and, uh, and, uh, and, basically, and um, basically what you can do is you can explore the, 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 the network of, of uh, lexical relations between terms. So, for instance, you can have an you have an hyponymy relation which links a river with the most uh, the more general term of, of stream and you have corresponding uh, corresponding uh, um, uh, scene sets with the definition associated to, to, to each of them. WordNet is only in English. Here you see a screenshots and uh, basically the user interface is available online. You can click on words and you can explore the graph of the of the, of the lexical relations. Um, this is basically meant uh, uh, to serve applications like uh, natural language processing, and um, but uh, there are there are a few limitations of this tool. Even if it is the, the so the, the reason of the success, I think it's mainly in the in the in the fact that they invested a significant number of years in creating the resource, and uh, and um, it's everything is handmade. And it has been done from the analysis of corpora. Uh, however, uh, here there is not a strict uh, distinction between uh, uh, what in an ontology would be called uh, classes of objects and uh, in uh, and individuals. So, so here you can see you can find terms like stream and river. But you can also find actual actual individuals like ispia, for instance. Um, uh, even if in the in the in the most recent versions, what they did is to dis distinguish between the two by marking them explicitly as individuals and connecting them uh, with the, with the class through a, an instance hyponymy relation. Other example of relations are, for instance, the antonym, which matches uh, which uh, indicates uh, a term and is opposite in meaning term. So, for instance, black and white, and so on and so on. Uh, so as I told you, WordNet is only in English, but there are other, other, other resources like MultiWordNet or EuroWordNet, which provide such information also in other languages. So for instance, EuroWordNet provides information also in Italian, Spanish, even Latin. And uh, uh, what they actually do, what they typically do, they establish a mapping between the languages in a very simple way. That is, you define your own scene set in, uh, in, in the language, and then you link them to the corresponding English one. Uh, I believe this is a very uh, simplistic approach because uh, even though they account for gaps, that is the possibility for a, that uh, there is no direct correspondence from a certain language, for instance, from Italian to English. So for instance, in Italian, we don't have one word for biking. So you should use a sentence, andare in bicicletta. And uh, because of that, uh, uh, in, in multi-wordnet, they invented a new notion apart from synset with the, that they call fraset, which indicates a kind of sentence that you have to use in order to, in order to basically uh, give the meaning of the corresponding term in English. Uh, but in other cases, they can also account, accommodate for, for gaps, so something that cannot really express unless you use a very long sentence. Um, but this is not symmetric. So what, this is, to me, one of the limitations. So, so uh, you cannot define a gap in English for another language. So English is used as a reference language. 
and, uh, and uh, you cannot really uh, um, modify the English part, which comes from WordNet, but you can only work at the level of the single languages. Also, despite the efforts, uh, there are, uh, they are very limited in coverage. So, for instance, if, uh, as far as I remember, Italian only covers 60% uh, of the, of the scene set in English. And uh, mostly they provide only the, the translation of the words, but they, they don't provide a corresponding uh, gloss. There are only a few exceptions, something like 2,000 scene sets over 100,000. So it's a very limited coverage. Uh, I also have an additional slide uh, concerning the limitations of these tools. So I'm taking a piece uh, of WordNet uh, rooted in the, into ed educational institutions. Actually, Subashi is here. He did some work in analyzing exactly the, this part uh, in Trento. And uh, if you inspect it, it's easy to see that there are some clear uh, problems with this kind of resources. So for instance, if you inspect the terms which are siblings, if it were an ontology, you would have expected that siblings have similar ontological characteristics. So, uh, for instance, if you take dancing school and religious school, so the definition of dancing school says that it is for students where, uh, and they learn to dance, while here is the school which is run by a religious body. So dancing here stands for the subject, and here instead stands for the, for the, uh, for the governing body. So the, 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 the characteristics here are different. So here, this one actually, if you think about it, it's a kind of training school. And, uh, and therefore, it should, be, it should be moved to a different uh, position to the hierarchy in which this is emphasized. So it should be grouped together with the other kinds of training schools. So for instance, you, can, you might put dancing school together with music school, for instance. Uh, also here, uh, I'm not a native speaker, but uh, I don't know whether any native speaker in this room can tell me uh, whether dance school is so significantly different from dancing school. So you, f you see all these kind of subtle differences and uh, there is no point in having such a fine-grained uh, distinction. So they should be grouped together and this would help a lot applications like NLP because when they have to dis disambiguate, instead of pointing to two different definitions, they will point to the same definition. Um, other limitations. So there is a lot of bias towards uh, the British and, U and US world. So for instance here, infant school is defined as a British school for children which are aged exactly in this range. So, I re so we really believe that there is a lot of space, what we call space and time bias. So definitions should be given in a way in which you don't refer to specific numbers. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you see. And <laughs> So that, that is. So if you go in this uh, in details of this, and actually what we did with Subashish, we took the UNESCO classification for education, and we tried to understand exactly what are the ontological uh, um, classes and how they are framed. And there is a primary, secondary, and tertiary organization of the educational uh, institutions. And basically, on this basis, you can uh, really organize uh, the terms in a better way. Um, um, so these, these are just some examples and uh, actually what we are trying to do in Trento is exactly to clean, let's say, these, uh, these resources in order to really remove such, uh, um, such references to specific systems. Also because in, in Trento in particular we have the goal to come up with a multi-language ontology which is uh, uh, as much as possible uh, uh, cult uh, culture independent. And therefore, you have to really uh, generalize as much as possible these definitions in order to remove such a bias. Another example. So this one is similar to dancing and, and dance school. So here, uh, again, I'm not an native speaker, but people tell me that uh, there is not much difference between a kindergarten and a nursery. Um, and also, some definitions are, really, are really strange, like a small preschool for small children. So it's really 
so it's really strange. Um, so you can see there is a lot of room for improvement in such, uh, in such resources. <laughs> and also, as I was telling to you, there are a lot of individuals. So this one, Winchester College, it's a clear uh, individual. So there is no point in having it in a dictionary. You would expect it in an, in an encyclopedia, but not into, into a dictionary. So uh, um, WordNet people make an, made an effort a few year, years ago in order to, re, to, to mark explicitly the individuals. They found something like 7,600. But if you inspect it, and especially if you look for, uh, for, uh, for those terms which are capitalized, uh, you will see a lot of examples of, uh, of, of individuals. So uh, in, in our work, we are also trying to identify them and remove them, because if you want a linguistic resource, you don't want individuals. You, you look for individuals in other resources, what, what we call the knowledge, the knowledge resources. So what is a knowledge resource? So while a linguistic resource provides information about languages, a knowledge resource provides information about uh, uh, entities in the real world. So what would typically find in, uh, in, uh, in knowledge resources is information about individuals, like Albert Einstein, which are in relation with other objects in the real world. So for instance, you have that he is born in Ulm, and that uh, he married uh, Mileva Maric, and uh, his initial affiliation was uh, the ATH in Zurich. And then uh, these are relations. You, also have, uh, you have also properties, attributes like date of birth with the corresponding date. So these are the typical kind of information that you find in a knowledge resource. Um, this is the, what uh, people uh, uh, refer with the term of ground knowledge. So what actually you know about the specific individuals. But then you may, might also have uh, the corresponding uh, ontological knowledge, so information about uh, uh, concepts and semantic relations between them. So for instance, here I marked with uh, blue color those parts which pertain to ontological knowledge, and with uh, red uh, those pertaining to, to actual individuals. Uh, now I'm going through a few examples, so I will quickly go through a few examples of, uh, of knowledge resources that have been built uh, in, the, in the past 30, 40 years. So one of those examples is Syke. So Syke uh, is born in a period in which uh, um, people were thinking to provide the machines information about commonsensical uh, knowledge. So information about what people understand about the reality, like uh, bananas are yellow, or a dog is an animal, or uh, plants die. This kind of information has been encoded in a way in which uh, machines can process them. And you have uh, things like Bill Clinton is the president of the United States, or uh, France is the, uh, so Paris is the capital city of, uh, of France. Um, uh, I think one of the limitations of these initial uh, tools is that they are purely knowledge resources. And they don't have explicit links or only shallow links with, uh, with the language. So uh, the best they can do uh, is to attach uh, uh, labels to these concepts to let uh, people understand uh, uh, what are they. But there is no formal definition. So I mean, there is no definition in natural language. There is no information about, uh, uh, about uh, the corresponding, what the corresponding term means. And uh, more importantly to what we are doing, for instance, in Trento, is that there, there, it's very hard to, 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 to reuse this and match, for instance, in various languages. For instance, if you want to offer the content in English rather than Italian or in Chinese, you don't have a, a, it's, it's not easy to come up with a mapping which allows you to, 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 to do that. Uh, other, and uh, and Psych is offered in three levels. So there is the so-called upper-level ontology. Uh, so for those of you who are not familiar with this term, so by upper-level ontology, typically people uh, uh, indicate uh, that part of the ontology which is general enough and provides very high-level uh, concepts, li like what is a physical object, what is an agent, or uh, what, is, uh, what is a location or a living being. Um, and then there is, uh, uh, at the leaves, uh, you have uh, some areas of the, of the ontology which pertain some specific uh, domains like uh, geography or whatever. 
uh, another ontology which has been developed, so another, uh, another uh, uh, knowledge resource which has been uh, um, built in, uh, in time is SUMO, uh, which is also similar in terms of uh, the way in which it is structured because it has a, a part which is an upper level ontology. And, uh, and then there is an extension which is called Milo, which covers uh, some specific domains. Both Psyche and, and Sumo are uh, manually built, uh, so and uh, as well as WordNet and MultiWordNet are, 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 are manually built. So they, they are trying to, so they are making an effort to make it very high quality. Um, and in fact, after the, the era of the purely manually built. Uh, Knowledge resources, there have been a period, a recent period, in which uh, people started creating them automatically. Uh, DBpedia is one of such attempts. So what they do, they go in Wikipedia, they identify semi-structured information, like this one, the, the so-called uh, info boxes in Wikipedia, and then they parse uh, the structure and, uh, in order to extract uh, useful uh, facts about the real world. So, for instance, they can uh, go in the page of the country Germany, uh, or, or better, the, the, the city of Berlin, and then they find information like the country in which it is located, Germany, the kind of government, uh, the, the, the square kilometers uh, area, and, and so on and so on. And then they build uh, uh, things like this, in which there is a, a, an extensive description of uh, of the content. Um, uh, even, even though what they do is, uh, so DBpedia uh, um, is born with the goal to systematize uh, the information in Wikipedia in a way in which it is queerable. And therefore, it's, uh, it's uh, basically based on uh, database technologies, but it's currently offered, as you see from this symbol here, also in, in, uh, in RDF or in other web, uh, web languages. Um, another example of uh, uh, very similar to DBpedia, it's, uh, it's Iago, because the Iago ontology also extracts automatical information from, uh, from Wikipedia, but there is a difference, and the difference is exactly in the top part, because what they do is to attach, they try to attach meaning to the terms uh, uh, extracted from, uh, from, from, uh, from Wikipedia. And uh, what they do is typically they extract from WordNet the part of the hierarchy concerning proper nouns that should, go, should indicate classes of objects. And they use this part in order to categorize uh, the, the entities which are taken from, uh, from Wikipedia. So first of all, they, they, they do a selection of the articles in Wikipedia. And they, they try to identify those pertaining to real world entities like movies, like locations, people, organizations. And then for each of them, they come up with, with, a, with a semantic network in which uh, for each single entity, you know, for instance, that Max Planck is born uh, in such and such city and it has uh, such and such properties. Uh, with, um, and then they, they, they say that these entities here and here are, are associated to the corresponding class. And the class is taken especially from uh, Wikipedia categories. So you know that every single Wikipedia page is associated to some categories. So they analyze, they parse the categories, and they try to identify the corresponding class by this ambiguity in the terms and associate it to scene sets in, uh, in WordNet. Um, so here you see an example of uh, such, uh, such, uh, such a, a linking. So you have Max Planck, and it's marked as an instance through the type relation in, in Iago, with the physicist uh, um, taken from, from WordNet. Yes? Or is that an error? <laughs> yeah, it's just a copy-paste from the, from the previous slides, and I forgot to change the definition of physicist. <laughs> No, 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 this is just my mistake, actually. Uh, so as you can see, the, 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 it is in three levels. You have the level of the concepts, which are taken from, uh, from, from WordNet. So for, each set, for every scene set, the concept is generated in the ontology. For, for each hypernym relation, a subclass uh, relation is generated. And then they associate, uh, so each Wikipedia article, the corresponding info box is parsed 
in order to come up with this graph. And according to the Wikipedia categories, what they do, they associate uh, to the corresponding uh, um, uh, concept. Uh, and they, of course, have their own heuristics in order to make sure that this is as accurate as possible. So they claim an accuracy of uh, around 95%, both in the facts and uh, 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 both in the facts and the linking with the corresponding classes. Um, but uh, so even in uh, uh, in this case, and I'm going to tell you later, there are some uh, there are some limitations of this approach. Um, another similar initiative is Freebase. Freebase, to some extent, is very similar to, to Iago, but uh, instead of taking uh, knowledge only from Wikipedia, it aggregates several, uh, several different um, um, resources. Actually, uh, I have to tell you that even in the case of Iago, initially they were only considering uh, Wikipedia, but nowadays uh, they also import other resources like, uh, for instance, uh, GeoNames, which is a data set which contains information about uh, around 7 million locations all over the world. Uh, so Fibrase is a huge uh, uh, knowledge base containing information about uh, real world entities. So as you can see from this snippet, this is very similar to Wikipedia information exactly because it comes from there. So apart from, uh, apart from uh, the, the, the text, which comes from the description in the, in the page, then the, the, the information about the properties of these entities are taken from the input boxes in a very similar way. So you may not know that, but basically Freebase, uh, it's uh, owned by a company which is called uh, MetaWeb that has been acquired by Google uh, two, three years ago for 30 billion yeah, millions of dollars. So it means that, and the kind of snippets that you see on the, on the right side of, of Google come from this, uh, this graph. Uh, many of such resources nowadays belong to the so-called linked data cloud. And in fact, the one that I uh, mentioned here are exactly those ones in the light blue. Uh, so Freebase is here, DBpedia is here. So you see here Yago, Psych is there the open version of Psyc, because there are two versions. One is, so it's a kind of freemium approach in which they have uh, the, the, the big ontology, which is, uh, which is under license, while they have a, a small part of it, which is free. Um, and uh, and uh, you see that most of the links in the cloud go into the DBpedia, and uh, it's simply because DBpedia was one of the first uh, approaching linked data, linked open data. And uh, this is a picture which is outdated, it is taken from 2009, and I did it on purpose because if you take the one, uh, the most recent one, it's so big that these spots become so small that you cannot really read it. So it's growing and growing, and, uh, and uh, basically each, of these, each arrow here indicates that there is a kind of mapping between uh, this resource and this other one. Um, then of course, even here there are uh, there are people who, who love this approach, and there are the people who, who criticize it. Uh, and in particular, my uh, my complaint about this approach is actually the one that I told you at the real beginning: is that the mappings are, are contextual, and therefore you don't know about whether the link that has been established here for a certain uh, for a certain application is uh, is something that makes sense to you. And also, we don't know the way in which the mapping has been has been computed. Whether the, if you remember the talk that uh, uh, Pavel gave yesterday, uh, so he said that there are uh, element level and uh, structure level uh, uh, matching techniques. So I, we don't know whether they took into account the single node or they took into account the context in which the node appears. So and therefore, you never know. Uh, once you follow two, three, four, five of these links what you get in, uh, in output is something which is really valu valuable or, or not. So now I'll spend the, the last 20 minutes. So first of all, if you have questions now, I don't know whether I've been clear or you just don't have questions. <laughs> okay. I thought your example of Berlin was a good example of where we need evolution because it said Berlin is in Germany well, before the Berlin Wall fell, it wasn't in Germany. There were two Berlins, and one was in East Germany and one was in West Germany. 
before the end of the Second World War, of course, there was one Berlin and it was in Germany. So these things change all the time. And uh, it, I thought that was a good example to illustrate the need for evolution in these, uh, in these ontologies. Yeah, actually, the person you have close to you, Subashi, should, should be very happy with your question <laughs> or your observation, because his PhD thesis is going to be exactly on the evolution of our knowledge and especially concerning geographical information. Because we know that uh, knowledge evolves, and uh, uh, you may know that uh, I did my PhD with Fausto Junqui, and uh, what he usually says is that the, at the moment in which you formalize something somewhere, it becomes obsolete. And basically, this is one of the real problems, that in order to evolve knowledge, you have to keep maintaining it, and it's really a, a huge investment. So that's why sometimes in specific applications, people design their own ontology, small ontology, exactly for the purpose they need, and they maintain it as, uh, for, the, for, the, for what they need, in a way in which it's, it's affordable. Uh, yes. Yeah, so isn't another problem of this, uh, I mean, the linked data approach is very, is very popular, but isn't another problem, I was thinking, okay, so if you wanted to provide the context, mm -hmm. so let's say through meta annotations or you know, additional contextual knowledge, it would just become another node. And then, so there are no different kind of layers and it's just a flat thing of different <laughs> pieces. And uh, even if I had more knowledge that I add, um, other people wouldn't know that this knowledge is there or they would have to explore it and so on. Yeah, sure. But there is also another problem that uh, maybe it's a little bit theoretical, but as Alan Bundy can tell, tell us, uh, I remember a paper I read about John McCarthy saying that basically this can be an unbounded problem because you, you can never fully capture a, a con the context in which something has been produced. And therefore, you can always uh, go one level up and identify other information that might be useful. So. That's why it's contextual at the end, because you take two parties, you identify what is the common, what are the common assumptions, and then you try to, to make them uh, explicit. So my usual example is, suppose nowadays that uh, Fiat and Chrysler are merging. So nowhere in the, in the, in the Chrysler uh, database is Chrysler is written, as well as Fiat is written in, the, in them. And therefore, you first of all have to make this information explicit. So in each and every record of fiat, you have to uh, write that this piece of information is about fiat. And the other one is about Chrysler, in a way in which when you merge the two, you know exactly uh, what is the context of the information. This is just a simple example, but in practice it becomes even more, more complicated. So what is uh, our approach in Trento? So first of all, I have to tell you a little bit about what, uh, what is our goal. So we are currently trying to develop a system which, is, uh, which taking, takes into account linguistic information and knowledge. And we want to make it multilingual and we want to, to make WordNet free, a kind of WordNet free version in which you have uh, 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 removed all the problems that I mentioned before. So a problem of space and time bias, you want to make it a little bit more an ontology than a linguistic, than a linguistic resource, because they define these linguistic relations that somehow correspond to semantic relations, but there is not a direct correspondence. So, so you have to turn uh, the hierarchy provided by WordNet into an ontology. And in order to do that, you have to do uh, operations like ontological analysis in order to understand the properties which are behind those concepts. And our group is kind of interdisciplinary. We are around 40 people coming from different backgrounds. We have people in computer science, but also people coming from linguistics, philosophy, and especially concerning the upper ontology, there are philosophers working in our group to define it. Uh, at the center of our approach, we have the notion of uh, entity. So ultimately, the kind of knowledge we want to, we want to cover is uh, about real world entities. So if you take a picture like this, you can identify many kinds of real world entities here. So for instance, there is a location, the stadium. Uh, uh, there is an event, the soccer match. Uh, 
um, you have organizations represented by the flag. Brazil is a geopolitical uh, object, which also creates its own problems, because is it a location, is it an organization? It's, uh, it's very difficult to discriminate these cases. And, uh, and then you have, of course, billions of, peoples, of people all around the world. So each of them can be described with different properties, but ultimately, if you think about it, there are some basic entity types in this world, and that they are no more than 10. So you, you, we every day speak about locations, events, organizations, uh, mine products, artifacts, but there are not so many uh, um, general entities. And then, of course, if you, if you consider any single macro level entity type, then you have more specific ones. So, so for instance, in terms of locations, you can identify uh, physical locations like mountains or bodies of wa water like lakes, rivers, and each of them will come with its own properties. But if you, if you, if you, if you think at the world in this way, you can think about coming up with a hierarchy of uh, entity types where the more specific entity types inherit properties for more general entity types. And I condensated in one slide uh, what is at the core of our approach. So we got inspired by, of course, all the previous knowledge resources and linguistic resources. What do we have is that we distinguish between uh, three different levels. We have the natural language, the formal language, and the ground knowledge level. So in our, in our knowledge resources, each single piece of information is marked, uh, is actually hosted in a different component. Where what we do is that we uh, pay, so we make an effort at the beginning to, through ontological analysis, to come up with the ontology. Then we assume that the ontology should be independent from the language. And therefore, once you know that, for instance, a, a river is a stream, then you can link to corresponding languages. So on one side you can have English, on the other side uh, you have uh, Italian. And here, uh, the immediate difference with respect to multi-word net or hero word net is that the link is not from the scene set to the other scene set, but it passes through an ontology. So it may seem as a small detail, but actually this makes a huge difference because you can concentrate on the development of ontology using certain methodologies and then incrementally in a, in a modular way, and this also allows us to scale, we can attach vocabularies uh, in, a, in a certain language. So for instance, nowadays uh, in, in our group we are working on uh, six, seven languages. We are currently uh, established a few collaborations with, with, uh, with universities in China, Mongolia, India, Bangladesh, Paraguay to, to plug it in the corresponding languages. And uh, the, the idea is that in due time we will populate uh, this, uh, this system with the various vocabularies. And actually uh, this, is this is also emphasized by the creation of two different systems. So we have a system that we call the UKC, which stands for Universal Knowledge, not because we pretend that we will create something that everybody will accept, but just because it, it will be used as a reference point for everybody to, 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 to establish these kind of links between languages. And uh, I'm simplifying at the minimum here because, uh, as you can imagine, there are a lot of issues pertaining uh, the differences in culture, difference in perception, uh, and, um, and uh, all the details concerning the representation of the natural language and the formal language. And uh, the, the second system is Entitypedia, in which we have the actual encyclopedia, in which we have individuals with, uh, with, uh, with their properties, where each single property here is not, uh, is, neither a, is not a string, but is connected to a concept at this level. So both the class and information about, for instance, if you add an attribute color, for a certain object, the information that color uh, that red is a color is here, and therefore the information that I don't know uh, a certain uh, car is red is linked to the notion of red rather than the word red here. Yes, can you explain to me what is formal language and what is ground knowledge? So, by formal language, we mean uh, the ontology. We mean the actual ontology, and uh, the ontology, as you can see here, I represented it simply as a number because here no single natural language label appears. Mm -hmm. 
So, we, uh, so in, in, uh, in, uh, in, of course, you cannot think to this object as totally disconnected from language because otherwise you would never know what one, two, three stands for. Mm -hmm. Uh, therefore, what we do is that each time we create a concept here in the formal language, it has to be created contextually with one synthset in a language. Yeah. So in a way in which there is a way by which you define what this uh, spot here stands for. And you can start from any language, which is one of the differences with respect to WordNet and multi -wordnet. That is, we are not biased toward uh, uh, a certain language because in multi word as, so, as I told you, you assume that uh, English is the reference and everybody else is linked to it. Here instead we have a reference ontology, any language can define a new concept, attach it to the hierarchy, define the corresponding scene set and then the others, as soon as they find a node which has not been yet lexicalized in their language, they can either define a scene set or a gap for it in the language. Where by gap, I mean the fact that it's, there is no word that can express that notion in, uh, in the language. And uh, I can give you some examples. So, for instance, in dealing with, uh, in, uh, with our friends in Mongolia, it came out that they don't have any word for seaport, simply because they don't have the sea. So they don't need to speak about them. And so unless they start traveling and, uh, and uh, perceive the need to have a word for it, they will not introduce any word in their language. And because of that, uh, basically, if you have seaport here in, uh, in, uh, in English, for instance, in the corresponding Mongolian, you will have a gap. And what we do is that we ask our friends in Mongolia to at least provide an explanation, to, to, to tell Mongolians what, uh, what this strange English guy uh, are, 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 um, are actually mean about this, uh, this spot here. And what is ground knowledge? So by ground knowledge, we mean the actual individuals of the real world. So for instance, ah. so, so here you have a common noun, which is river, which mm -hmm. indicates, uh, uh, as you see from the definition, the natural, a, a large natural stream of water. Uh, I'm not a physicist. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, basically you say that Mississippi River is an actual individual, which is a, a, a river. And uh, so, for instance, you can, uh, I don't know, maybe you can define Ischia as an island. Yeah. And then you can provide information about it, like the latitude, the longitude, uh, uh, the circumference, the square meter area, and any other property that you, you may think about. And the, such information is here. Okay. And this is actually, so for instance, for those of you who know about uh, description logic, uh, so this part is what is called the T-box, so this is the part uh, providing the theory in general terms. Mm. And this is the A-box, that mm. is uh, what you know about the, 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 the current uh, situation that you are, you are describing. Because then this part can be recycled many times to describe different situations. Okay, thank you very much. It seems to me that there's uh, grounds for disagreement even at that ground knowledge level. So, and particularly with rivers, particularly if they flow through several different countries, with different languages, they actually may label them differently. I mean, if you have tributaries coming in, you know, which of the tributaries inherits the name of the main river could be quite controversial. And uh, um, so there, there may well be disagreement there. Do you allow mappings at the ground knowledge level as well? Yeah, because uh, so uh, at the beginning, when we started, we thought about uh, Entitypedia as, uh, as a kind of universal encyclopedia like, uh, la, uh, uh, like Wikipedia. Uh, but then we basically, what we did, we as abstracted the Entitypedia and, uh, and this one became more a technology, which allows you, like in databases, to store uh, uh, knowledge. And then what we allow is to have satellite entitypedias, each of them with their own content. And then similarly to the, to the linked data approach, we allow those, uh, those uh, different encyclopedia to be linked to each other. At the moment, uh, the approach we are thinking about is that each single local uh, uh, encyclopedia will be equipped with, uh, with the language. And uh, you can locally customize even the language. So you may decide that for your local purposes, you, river is not the, the, the right level of granularity you want, and you want to add the rivulet, or maybe you, you, you disagree on the definition of stream, you change it locally, and the idea is that when you establish the mapping, you only use whatever you have in common between the two. 
So uh, the, we are at very early stages, so we are, uh, we are quite uh, extensively investing time in creating the, the, the underlying technology to store such an information. And we are actually working at establishing the collaborations with, uh, with university worldwide to, to provide uh, the languages. Also, something which is also very expensive is to develop this part. Because initially we bootstrapped it with uh, WordNet, then we discovered all such limitations I told you before. And, uh, and now, now we, in, uh, in developing this part, we are employing our own uh, methodologies, which uh, are inspired by ontological principles, but go beyond them. And in fact, I have a few minutes left. Uh, my intention is to briefly give you an idea of the kind of methodologies that we are employing to develop this part. Um, uh, you will receive these slides, right, Michael? I think you went away. Okay. So uh, I'm not spending much time on this uh, summary slide in which we compare our uh, uh, technology with respect to the state of the art uh, uh, linguistic and knowledge resources, in particular the knowledge ones. And, um, and uh, um, coming back to the previous slide, I think one of our main uh, features is really this decoupling between the natural language and the ontology. Please. Um, so if I understood you correctly, attributes and values are only for the concrete entities. Is there yes. also a possibility of abstracting away from them for the upper nodes? Like what? Yeah. We do, we do. Okay. We do. Actually, this is actually part of the methodology. So I'll give you uh, briefly the idea. So, so this is one, of, uh, one slide I like very much, <laughs> like the first one I showed you which shows that uh, small differences matter. So we really share 98.8% of our DNA with shrimps. So we are almost shrimps. And uh, so I told you before that existing knowledge resources don't go beyond 95% of accuracy, which means we are, we are far beyond the shrimps. So we really need to make an effort as community to, to come up with ontology which are of better quality. Our answer to that is that we are, we are doing them manually. And, uh, and this, of course, is a tremendous effort, but we, what, we are do, do, what we are doing is to come up with methodologies, and we do it in a modular way. Uh, so uh, modularity comes from the definition of domains, so we define uh, domains like geography, chemistry, sport, and then we define local vocabularies, and we create ontologies which are uh, specifically address uh, those domains. And in our methodology, the first thing that we, 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 we think about is, okay, what are the actual important entities in geography? So you have the locations, and therefore you have to come up with uh, a, a, a general definition of what a location is, the corresponding attributes, and then you can go into, into more details about uh, uh, classes, but also attributes and relations. And in fact, our uh, uh, main notions in the approach are the entities, the actual entities of the real world we want to talk about, their classes like dog, person, and then we also pay attention to terminology which is needed to express relations, like friend, or terminology which is needed to, to attributes, like color. And therefore, we define in the ontology also the attribute color, uh, the various colors, like red, blue, black. And for each of them, we have a node into the ontology. So I'm going to give you only two additional slides, and then I'll stop. Uh, so this one is an example of the kind of ontologies that we, are, uh, we have been developing. So here you have entity classes, so locations are framed into landforms, natural elevations, natural depressions, uh, bodies of water and so on. And then you have the corresponding relations like directional relations like east, north, south, west. And you have attributes like name, latitude, longitude, altitude, area. And then in some cases you can also define the values, so the range that those attributes might have in ontological terms. So you, each single value is a node in the ontology. And we define this, uh, this uh, relation that we call value of, which defines that deep is a possible attribute of, the, of, the, of that. So whenever you find some anywhere the, the word deep, it can only be used as an attribute value. It cannot be used in other ways. So we put some constraints on the way in which you can take these single nodes here, like bricks, 
and you create, uh, 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 you describe the, the, the real world entities. And all of this is inspired by uh, a methodology borrowed from library science, uh, a, a librarian called Ranganathan, that uh, la the past century came up with a uh, similar methodology to arrange books on the shelves in libraries. And basically, we are using it in order to, to frame knowledge in a way in which you can represent entities instead of representing what books are about. Uh, my last slide is that this is the way in which we come up with the scene set uh, and the corresponding definition of a term. So what we do, suppose you want to come up with a definition for school in a way in which, which is free from space and, pi and time bias. So what we do, is we uh, go on the web, we look at the existing free dictionaries uh, that provide definitions about, about them, in particular WordNet, because we always start uh, from WordNet. And then we divide the definition, we identify what we call the genus and the differential. By genus, we basically mean the parent concept. What is the parent concept? And by differential, how this node will be differentiated by the, from the siblings. And uh, by comparing the various uh, definitions in this way, we understand that there is, this, this, there is completely agreement about the fact that uh, school is an institution. There, is a slight, there are slightly different ways by which uh, is further defined. So here you can only say that this is an educational institution. This one for educating children, for teaching children. And here is more general because it says the teaching students. So you can teach also someone who is not a children, an, an adult, can be, can be instructed. And therefore, uh, by analyzing these and by using some principles uh, that we are borrowing from library science and we are extending and we are uh, um, adapting to our purposes, we come with definitions like an educational institution designed for the teaching of students under the direction, direction of teachers. So here there is no more space and time bias. So uh, here the, the time bias might be seen as so, Instructing children can be seen as a time bias. So only people up to a certain age can be instructed and then, and then you cannot instruct them anymore. So with this kind of work, we hope that we will not completely solve the problem inter in, of interoperability around, around the world, but we will try to smooth it as much as possible. So I will close with this slide. So if you have other questions. Uh, but also this example shows that Wikipedia is the most accurate uh, version basically because it's crowdsourced and it is manually curated effectively. Well, uh, true that it comes from a, from a, from a selection of, uh, so it's already the result of a, of a, of a negotiation between different people. So for sure it has to be taken into account. So, but what we are trying to do is to really consider as many sources as possible. And also Wikipedia, of course, it cannot be used as such, but has to be formalized or at least structured in a way in which, uh, in which can be used. And therefore, uh, there are a lot of attempts, not only us, like Iago, like Wikipedia, that in the past I tried to, to organize it in a way in which it's queerable or exploitable for, for, automated, uh, for automated reasoning. But true, so we, we extensively use Wikipedia to, to get an idea of what uh, the term is about, and then we, we use this methodology to, to, to tune the definition in a way in which we, uh, we, make, we, 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 we hope that we are, uh, we are improving respect to the, the single other approaches. Um, I just wonder about the example of Brazil that you put up earlier. So how do you tackle such cases? Do you just speak about countries and nations separately or is there some <laughs> So you, you really took one of the most difficult uh, cases to... So uh, personally, it's uh, something like two, three years that I'm thinking to this. I didn't come with a final uh, solution. So there are a lot of theories who try to explain this, uh, this, um, uh, this phenomena. In particular, there is, for instance, in linguistics, there is Pustoyevsky, who came up with uh, this notion of dot objects. 
So there are some objects which are so complex in nature in the world, which have uh, some sort of different components which, uh, which are there at the same time. Other examples, uh, for instance, if you take a book, people say that a book is a complex object which contains content, and, but it's also a container. And that therefore, it has physical properties, but it has also properties like the author, uh, copyright information, and so on, which belong to the more to the abstract part of uh, of the book. And uh, actually, there are people like Guarino that, when you go into ontological analysis, they say there are different identity criteria because the book has an identity criteria uh, which is given by the physical property, and uh, the, the, and uh, while the the the, the, con the con different identity criteria and the example that they give is that if you have on the shelf five books where three of them are three copies of the same uh, object you can say how many objects do you see there three or five so these kind of uh, things are very difficult to, to really uh, discriminate and then um, various people came up with different uh, ways to solve the problem so at the moment, uh, the solution that we are employing is to have a kind of uh, lightweight uh, multiple inheritance by which you have what we call the essential inheritance given by the ISA relation. And then we have, uh, we, we, we have uh, another inheritance which comes from, the, uh, from some accidental inheritance. So there, there is also a lot of, of work by Sears about social objects which they say that there are some objects that if you give them to my dog, they don't understand what is that. So for instance, if you take a banknote and you give it to your dog, it's just a piece of paper for it. So, so uh, all these kind of very complex, uh, and what we are trying to do is to really identify within uh, these resources, some patterns and trying to address each of them separately to understand uh, 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 what, how to tackle them, because in, in, uh, in several of those cases, it's even more complicated than that, because uh, they don't only uh, are an ontological puzzle, but they are also linguistically a problem, because they generate polysemy. So take the example of bank as institution, as building, and, uh, uh, and people. So in, in WordNet, there are tons of those cases in which for each word like this one, you have three different senses. And uh, this is due to, the, to a similar phenomenon in which really uh, people try to uh, use similar terms for related objects, but they are not actually the same object. And therefore, if you, if you go to the formal level, that's why I think that our framing into the natural language, formal language, and ground knowledge helps, is that if you go to the formal level and you free your mind from language, then this helps in identifying a solution for those cases. Because maybe you have only one word in natural language and you, are, you, you keep being puzzled by this because for you they are the same thing, but they actually, ontological, they are three different objects. And but, therefore, even if in natural language you have only one word, you should represent them with three different objects. But do you want to separate these entities if they are so, so close in natural <laughs> language? Is that it? Well, uh, just just to close, I think uh, so. Here, what we, what we uh, we are at the moment, what is at the moment our solution is to really, as I told you, come up with the definition of general objects and then address for change. So, for instance, in the case of geopolitical entities, so you have to accommodate for evolution in knowledge, and uh, therefore you realize that uh, countries change in shape, in time, and that this should give you hints about how to represent them. But uh, we don't think we arrive at the ultimate uh, solution for this problem yet. During the coffee break. So thanks very much to everyone. Thank you. <laughs>